Hello, uh, welcome to the second Cosmology Talk. I have with me Sesh Nadifa, who uh, actually I did a PhD with at the same time, uh, and then he went from there to be a postdoc in Bielefeld, then Helsinki, and now he's a, a postdoc in Portsmouth. So uh, his paper on um, the void galaxy cross-correlation and large-scale structure, what that impact has on cosmic acceleration and measurements of H0, I found very interesting. So, yeah, take it away, Sesh. What what did you do <coughs> in the uh, in the paper? Right. So, so this paper was looking at um, what cosmological implications uh, our measurement of the void galaxy cross correlation has when combined with uh, with other uh, measurements of large scale structure. So, uh, including BAO and an RSD. And BAO and RSD uh, are uh, short forms for, for very standard large scale structure measurements, barren acoustic oscillations and retro space distortions. So those things have been, been studied for, for decades and have been applied to basically every spectroscopic galaxy survey uh, that has been performed. Uh, but the void galaxy cross correlation measurement is something that's pretty new. Uh, and we put out a paper uh, doing this measurement uh, in 2019 um, and now we were starting to explore what uh, what we can say about uh, cosmic acceleration on the basis of those measurements. Cool. And so, someone who's listening to this talk, uh, what are say two very simple things that, if if this is all they take from the talk, what what should they take from it? Uh, right. So uh, I guess the the first important thing that that people would want to take from this is what the hell is a void galaxy cross correlation, right? Okay. Uh, and, and why does it tell us anything about cosmology? Uh, and essentially, um, you can picture this as being, uh, we're looking at uh, the, the distribution of galaxies around uh, regions of very low density in the universe. Uh, and those regions are what we, uh, we call voids. Uh, and uh, the distribution of galaxies around those centers is not symmetric. Uh, so there's, there's an anisotropy uh, in that distribution uh, along the line of sight direction from us to the, that low density region. Mm -hmm. uh, and the details of that anisotropy uh, are governed by uh, the movement of galaxies due to velocities just under the influence of gravity and also uh, the model of cosmology that we have used uh, in order to convert angles and redshifts, which is really what we observe, into distances, uh, which is what we try to predict. Right. So, um, so, so that's that's basically what the measurement is about. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that you might want to take from this is uh, the results that we we get out and that we're discussing in terms of, of cosmology. Yeah. Um, and, and we had a, a, a three interesting cases that we looked at there uh, in terms of how well this can help us measure the expansion rate of the universe. So at the current uh, rate of expansion, given a few assumptions, uh, so what we're measuring is the Hubble constant, essentially uh, H0. Uh, and this is a particularly hot topic at the moment because uh, various different measures of, of this give different answers. Uh, and it's all very confusing. So this is a, another way to, to tighten measurements of it. Cool. Uh, so, so the two things would be exactly what a void galaxy cross correlation is and how one actually obtains it in real space, yeah. given that you're not measuring in real space. And the second thing is the cosmological consequences, perhaps in particular, your measurement of, of H0. Yeah. Um, cool. So I guess you've partially answered this via the, uh, the answer so far, but if you could spend a little bit talking about like why, why was this an important thing? Why did, why did you guys actually decide to, um, to do this and not, you know, something else? Like what uh, is the background? So you partially explained it with like H naught is this interesting thing you wanted to make a measurement of H naught, but is there more you want to say about that? Uh, well, okay. So, so from, from one perspective, uh, it's interesting because, um, from, from my point of view, uh, I've been interested in, in what you can do with voids and, and studying voids for a long time. Uh, and the fact that you can do this, this really cool 
uh, cosmological measurement is is the reason that I got involved in it. Uh, for the, from the perspective of somebody who's uh, maybe not uh, so uh, tuned into voids and, and so on, then why should you pay attention to this? The really cool thing is that um, uh, by using the void galaxy cross correlation to make measurements, it turns out that we can improve the precision with which we can measure uh, important quantities like the expansion rate and, and the growth rate of structure and distances and so on. We can improve the precision of those quantities by a factor of about two. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, to get an improvement uh, of a factor of two by using standard methods alone, so the BAO and RSD methods that I spoke about, uh, it, because the, the error goes as the, the square root of the uh, the volume, the data volume, essentially, uh, you'd need to have a survey that was four times as big. So yeah. the survey that we used as a BOSS galaxy survey, and that ran for five years collecting data. Right? So I imagine that you had that telescope operating for 20 years instead of five years. Right. And that's, that's sort of the amount of uh, information gain that we're able to provide. And it didn't take you 20 years to do the data analysis. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Cool. I, I think yeah, that's quite. The, the data is already there, right? It's already yeah, been taken. Yeah. So basically, this analysis is free. And and it, and this obviously, I'm assuming you you've obviously done the statistics correct. So this like decrease in a factor of two because it's using the same data, but it's using sufficiently different aspects of the same data that the amount of new independent information reduces that by the factor. Yeah, yeah. So so uh, this is obviously something that we we need to uh, uh, to check, and we did check it. Yeah. Um, but the the um, the type of measurement that we're making is sufficiently different and on different scales mm. that in fact there's very little correlation between uh, the results you get from two, two different methods from the same data. Cool. Um, so let, let's get into the nitty-gritty now then. Like what, what, did, what did you do? Like what, what is the void galaxy cross-correlation? What is a void? I mean maybe don't answer what a galaxy is um, and uh, <coughs> talk us through it uh, with, okay. with or without slides. Yep. Yeah, so, so let me just uh, share some, some slides with you. Uh, okay, uh, and let's make that full screen. Viewing. Play, that's what it is, play. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, you see that? Um, yeah, definitely. I can actually see your cursor this time, so it might be that um, so can the world. Yeah. So uh, it's just I've got to put the little video thing somewhere so it doesn't block the slides. No. Oh no, it's not blocking on my screen. I mean, it might be blocking on oh, yours. Okay. But I yeah, don't think that, 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 that's great then. The recorded thing will just have us on the right and uh, just the slides on, on the front. Okay, so, so this is a little slide that I always show at the, the start of talks uh, yeah. because a lot of people in the audience, uh, you know, even when I'm giving a specialist sort of seminar, uh, don't really, uh, are, are not very familiar with what the void galaxy correlation is. Um, but just like uh, a standard correlation function, this is measuring the excess probability of there being uh, a galaxy at a particular distance from uh, the center of a void. So uh, the first step in actually measuring this is to Id identify what you're going to call the center of the void. Uh, so th as I said at the beginning, the voids are regions of low density. Uh, so you've got to first find those regions in space uh, and then look at the distribution of galaxies around them. So uh, here on the left, uh, uh, there's a uh, a schematic view, uh, essentially, of what the uh, void galaxy correlation looks like. So since it's describing the excess probability, uh, and since voids are low density regions, there are not going to be any galaxies right at the center of voids. Mm -hmm. So the uh, cross correlation has a value of minus one there, uh, right. which is just saying that voids are empty, there are no galaxies there. And, and minus one essentially says there's zero probability that there's a galaxy there, which kind of makes sense, yeah. I guess. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so uh, a cross correlation value of minus one means zero probability, right? Uh, and a value of zero means exactly the mean probability. So, uh, which is what it goes uh, to at 
like just distance, I guess. At, at asymptotically at, at infinity, yeah. So there's an interesting at, feature I see there, which is it gets hot before it goes to zero. Like it's not just gradually going to zero. So that there is some distance where you actually have a more than typical probability of seeing a galaxy. Is that something interesting you want to talk about or? Yeah, so uh, I mean, uh, that, that's quite an intuitive uh, picture, right? So uh, over the whole universe, you've got um, a certain number of galaxies and, and uh, if there are going to be some regions that have lower than average density, uh, that's got to be compensated by regions that have higher than average density, right? That's just what the average means. Um, and uh, <coughs> for particular voids, you, you've got um, a, a slightly different shape or, and uh, exactly where this over dense uh, bump region, as you refer to it, it you know, comes about, uh, depends on the properties of the, the, the void population. But uh, th the basic point is, You've got a region where there are no galaxies. Those galaxies have got to be somewhere. They're in the high density uh, filaments and clusters and so on that are on the outside of, of the void or on the boundaries of the void. And so as you go further away from the center, at some point you start seeing these overdense regions and that's what's giving you this, uh, okay. this bump. And this characteristic distance does sort of depend on the, like the scale over which the void was defined as well. It's not like the BAO, which is like a, a hard ruler. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, this scale depends on uh, various things like um, uh, the, the properties of the, the galaxy survey that you used in order to search for these voids and so on. So it's very much not like the BAO. Yeah. Uh, it's not a fixed cosmological thing. And uh, that actually becomes kind of important in our analysis. So the BAO is, is, a, is a standard ruler so the size uh, of you know the, the particular scale gives you information. Uh, in this case, uh, the size of the voids doesn't give you any cosmological information. Instead, you can view voids as being standard spheres. So we're, what we're not uh, looking at is what is the size of that sphere. We're looking at how distorted it is away from sphericity. Cool. Uh, so, I mean, basically that's what's uh, indicated in this. So the left-hand uh, panel is where it's undistorted. So this is uh, where there's no galaxy velocities complicating matters. And we know the positions of the galaxies exactly. Uh, and we get something that is spherically symmetric, or in this case, uh, symmetric along the line of sight distance. Right? Yeah. And then if you take into account the fact that galaxies will be moving and typically uh, void regions are, are under dense and so galaxies will typically be moving out. The particular velocities will be driving them out uh, radially from the, the center of the void. <coughs> uh, and so this means that galaxies that are on the near side of the void to us will <coughs> typically be moving towards us uh, and, and those that are far away will be moving away from us and so we see their positions uh, uh, distorted by this, this redshift effect. Uh, yeah. and, and that gives rise to this uh, a pattern on the right where the, the iso contour, um, iso density contours of the uh, uh, cross correlation get stretched and or squished depending on the distance from the center of the void. Cool, cool. Uh, so so this, this plot actually just shows you what happens due to galaxy velocities around voids. Mm -hmm. uh, but in, in uh, dealing with real data, uh, we have the second effect, which is actually the more interesting and important effect, mm -hmm. uh, which is that um, it's, it's not just the velocities that give rise to these distortions, but the fact that we may be converting uh, the galaxy uh, redshifts into distances using a cosmological model that doesn't match the true universe. Right. Uh, so if our model exactly matched the true universe, then we'd see exactly this sort of a picture uh, as on the right here. But if it doesn't match it, then we're putting in an extra distortion on top of the distortion from the velocities. And, and that matching is the sort of undergraduate cosmology matching between 
like scale factor and redshift and so you know the time it took to get here so you know the distance and what you're saying and, and going into that are things like h naught and the density and the curvature and things to, to know the expansion rate as a function of time and you're saying if, if you if h naught was slightly bigger or the density of matter was slightly smaller or whatever then it's actually a slightly further distance away than than you thought uh, yes uh, although h naught doesn't go into it because uh, oh. all these distances are uh, scaled in uni units of h inverse megaparsec. So we've basically taken ah, okay. h naught out. H, h is h naught is just you know it, it's a constant that affects all these distances. Uh, what what it does affect uh, what does affect it is uh, omega matter, uh, uh, omega lambda. So the amount of dark energy, uh, and if you move away from a from a, a lambda CDM model, then you know other things that might affect the the relative expansion rate. Not the constant at the front, but sure. relative. Ah, yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, see, I guess you do have H inverse on the axes, so I should have looked more carefully. Uh, <laughs> cool. Yeah. Uh, so do you want to... <coughs> yeah, okay. So um, uh, it, the interesting uh, point about using the void galaxy correlation uh, as opposed to... I mean, uh, this, this effect, as you said, is, is fundamentally an undergraduate physics uh, effect and uh, in terms of what you can do for, for cosmology uh, it was first pointed out in a very famous nature paper in 1979 by Alcock and Paczynski so it's known as the Alcock Paczynski effect um, and and this affects like it affects uh, every measurement that we make with with galaxies so every time we convert galaxy redshifts to distances so it obviously affects the standard galaxy clustering as well. And so it goes into BAO, it goes into you know, modeling the galaxy power spectrum and all sorts of things. Um, so therefore you can measure it in many different ways. Uh, the, the question is why is the void galaxy uh, correlation a better way of measuring this than the standard techniques, right? Uh, mm. And so here I have a uh, uh, just, uh, a, a plot on the left, which shows you the galaxy uh, auto correlation. So the excess probability of finding a galaxy as a galaxy. And on the right is uh, what you saw before on the previous slide, voids cross galaxies. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, the problem with the uh, galaxy auto correlation is uh, that the redshift space distortion effects, so the effects that come from galaxy velocities, are uh, much harder to model uh, mm. in this on, on the left and and they're harder to model because galaxies typically live in very overdense regions mm -hmm. where the density contrast is is high so it's it's far from from one and the physics becomes nonlinear uh, and the coupling between density and velocity uh, is also nonlinear so it's it's uh, it makes the modeling a lot more complicated right <coughs> On the right hand side, uh, instead we're talking about how galaxies move around regions which have very few galaxies. Uh, and there, uh, the, the, the physics that describes uh, the way that these velocities evolve is, is much closer to linear. So uh, in fact, it, the RSD model is a lot easier to write down uh, and is accurate on uh, down to much smaller scales. So, so even though on the right you've still got galaxies there, you've got like some specific subset of galaxies that are, are sort of proximate to an underdense region and therefore they're in a, a more linear evolution than the ones yeah. on the left, which is just all galaxies, most of which are in an overdense region and therefore very hard to model. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Uh, and it also... Uh, uh, there's another more, more technical aspect of this, which is that in large parts of the galaxy uh, auto power spectrum or correlation function, um, the, the effects of galaxy motions uh, and the alcock paczynski distortion uh, actually produce very similar uh, observable effects on the, the power spectrum. So, so it's quite hard to separate you know, what's been caused by what. Uh, whereas in the void galaxy Cross correlation. It turns out that uh, the the velocity distortions have a completely different signature to okay. the distortions that we get from from having the wrong cosmology. Interesting. Okay. Cool. 
<coughs> and do, do you want to, are you going to go into detail of what that difference is? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I probably won't go into all the, the details of the equations, but maybe I'll just show you uh, uh, this, this block, which uh, kind of illustrates. So, so uh, this shows you the, the quadrupole moment of the void galaxy correlation okay. function. So, so the quadrupole moment is essentially um, is, is telling you uh, how much uh, distortion you have in, in, that, um, in your standard sphere. Right? So I could write down an equation uh, showing you how exactly you calculate that, but just want to give you a, more of a physical picture. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the target audience is kind of PhD student of cosmology, so maybe okay. quadrupole. Uh, maybe but on the other hand, I, I actually don't have a slide with this written down on it, so I'm not going to. Uh, no, no, but you do, you take, the, take the, the void galaxy cross correlation and expand it in the genre multiples. Uh, and uh, you're going to have a monopole, which is just describing the the average, the angle averaged um, void galaxy correlation. So uh, it's it's the one dimensional profile of, of the galaxy density around voids. Uh, and then you have the, the next order moment uh, that is non-zero is the quadrupole. Uh, and that's what's shown in these plots. So on the left hand side, uh, you've got uh, the quadrupole as it changes um, based on uh, the, the alcock Patinsky effect. Um, so the effect of, of changing your cosmology essentially in a particular way. Uh, and on the right hand side, it's uh, the effect of changing the, the growth rate of structure. And uh, the growth rate of structure affects the, the velocities of these galaxies as how fast they're moving away from the voids. Uh, so on the, on the left, you've got the cosmology effect. On the right, you've got the, the velocity effect. And okay, uh, you can see that as you, uh, well, the, the, uh, the effect of, of changing them uh, makes very different uh, changes to the shape of the quadrupole. Okay. Right? So the, the, the underlying uh, quadrupole shape on the left and the right is, is broadly similar. That's because ah, it's yeah, of course. the same yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and and the shape of this is quite interesting, right? So so what happens is, uh, right at the center of the void, you don't have any quadrupole, and that's because you don't have any galaxies there. So there's nothing that can be uh, anisotropic. Yes. And then at at relatively small distances, so on this this plot, around about twenty h inverse megaparsecs, uh, your your void is expanding. So you've got an outflow velocity. So your void looks like it's stretched along the line of sight, mm -hmm. which is, is what you expect from a naive, you know, Kaiser redshift space distortion picture. Yeah. And then when you move to the over dense bump region that we spoke about right at the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, then you get the opposite effect where, where you get a, a, a Kaiser squishing. When you get kind of past the, uh, past the yeah. bump and so, things are moving so, into, so, the, or into the center of your coordinate system. Which is the void? Is that right? No. Or are you talking about uh, the outer system, system is, is S of zero. Yeah. Uh, here, right at the center. Yeah. So, so <coughs> at 60 is where things are moving towards the center, is it? Uh, at 60 is where uh, you have the, the overdense bump. So there, things on the outside of that are moving towards the center and things on the inside of it are moving out from the center. So you get, you get a, a squishing around there, which leads to a positive okay. quadrupole. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so, so the effect as you change from red to orange to you know, yellow, blue, and so on in these lines, the effect of changing the growth rate on the right or changing uh, the alcock pachinsky parameter uh, on the left uh, those are, are, are very distinguishable. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I was being dense earlier and the curves look the same, but of course they look the same because they're distortions of the same curve, but yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. They're distortions of the same curve, but they're very different distortions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so, yeah, so the key is... point, well, one of the key points is that this is not the same for the galaxy cross target autocorrelation that these two curves would look quite similar. Uh, well, I don't have a plot of, uh, of that, but uh, yes, essentially, uh, if you think about the, the galaxy power spectrum, um, uh, at, 
at a wide range of scales, the power spectrum is quite close to a power law, uh, which means it doesn't have features. Uh, and where, where you don't have features, then by shifting the scales, you're basically, you're moving uh, a curve left or right or up and down is, is uh, and those two are quite degenerate. It's hard, hard to tell them apart. So in the galaxy power spectrum, what does help you to distinguish this is where you've got the big feature from the BAO peak. Right? And, and in this case, we've got a feature in the quadrupole uh, and, and that, that feature is helping us to distinguish um, th these two effects. Okay. Okay. Um, right. So uh, there are various complications that we have to consider about how you actually measure this thing in surveys, but maybe uh, we'll leave that for for um, uh, a different talk. And not yeah. For this well, once once this one has a million views and they're clamoring for, um, for follow up, <laughs> we can uh, we can go into the details. Yeah, so uh, the, the interesting thing is that, you know, whatever, we solved the problem, so how to measure it, uh, and then we did measure it. Yes. Uh, and then on the, on the left-hand side, um, you see the- And presumably, like, calibrated this measurement to simulations <laughs> very carefully so that you knew that you were in, had, like, all of the potential, like, non-independence information taken into control yeah. and everything. Yeah, so, so we used a, a, a thousand mock simulations mm -hmm. of, uh, of this data sample <coughs> cool. and ran, you know, the entire uh, pipeline for, for measuring this on those mocks. And in the mocks, of, of course, you know exactly what cosmology you should be getting out and you check that we do get out that cosmology at the end and so on. So, cool. so we did all that kind of test for systematics and stuff. <coughs> so on the left-hand side, uh, the actual data and the theory curves. Uh, so you have the, the monopole, which shows you, uh, you know, psi of, of minus one at the center, uh, which is what we spoke about. And then it goes uh, up towards uh, psi of zero and it slightly overshoots, which is the overdense bump at the, at the top. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it asymptotes back to psi of zero at the end. Uh, uh, so, sorry, yeah. Uh, and then you have the, the quadrupole, uh, which has the, the feature that we've already discussed, a negative dip and then a positive rise. Mm -hmm. uh, and the right-hand plot over here shows uh, the uh, constraints that you get out on the cosmological parameters from fitting this. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's various parameters there, but the, the important ones are uh, the alcock pachinsky parameter uh, and the, the growth rate. And um, I've labeled them on the plot. Uh, the, and the important thing is that these two are not particularly strongly degenerate with each other. Right. And also that we were able to get a 1% measurement of this alcock pachinsky parameter. The alcock pachinsky parameter is essentially uh, the, the distance, uh, the cosmological distance scale from us to the redshift at which these voids and, and galaxies are, mm -hmm. uh, times uh, the expansion rate uh, H of Z at that redshift. Cool. Okay. Uh, right. So uh, we, you asked about how we uh, we check, you know, on data, uh, the the this measurement and other measurements that are done on the same data are independent, and mm -hmm. the yeah. uh, covariance matrix shown on this on the right hand side is basically the result of that check. Right. So so we check uh, that the measurements that we make of important quantities. Uh, so FAP is the alcock pachinsky parameter again, and F sigma eight is the growth rate. Uh, and this covariance matrix is showing you what happens if you measure FAP, uh, F sigma eight, and uh, the, the mm -hmm. actual BAO size scale. And that's, that's given by DV over, over the standard horizon mm -hmm. uh, RD. Uh, so these are our fundamental quantities that you can measure from the same data using BAO method, the RSD method, and our method. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, what you want to focus on here is the, the top two rows right. of the uh, covariance matrix. Uh, and uh, the, the, the values along most of those top two rows are pretty close to zero. 
which means yeah presumably yeah. that the difference from zero could even just be consistent with randomness right yeah it's, it's not yeah, going to be zero I, exactly in any actual data okay yeah so so for for most purposes values this small and this close to zero are essentially zero and we just mm -hmm. you can treat them as zero okay uh, of course given that we've we've gone and measured it you know we, we actually use the numbers ah, okay that cool. we've got right. in the data mm -hmm. we don't just set them to zero mm -hmm. but it's it's as good as being zero okay yeah uh, and so uh, if you then you know use this covariance matrix to combine uh, the the measurements that you have from from bao and and rsd and mm -hmm. voids um, you get uh, results like on the left so uh, y-axis is is the growth rate f sigma eight mm -hmm. at uh, redshift of 0.57, which is the the mean redshift of this sample, and the x-axis is the Alcock Brzezinski parameter again, mm -hmm. and the gray contour shows uh, the best constraints you you get from combining BAO and RSD, mm -hmm. uh, and then the orange is how much you you shrink that when you add void information in. I see. Right. So you've actually got a, about a factor of four improvement in the measurement of FAP itself, yeah. uh, which is pretty dramatic. Yeah, cool. Yeah, that's that's good. And, and that, that table on the right is good. That it shows that it really is like mostly independent, if not completely yeah. independent information. Awesome. Cool. So uh, at some points on these slides, uh, I use uh, the, the shorthand notation FS which stands for full shape oh, okay. um, and that's the full shape of the galaxy power spectrum which means the same thing as doing uh, RSD so uh, when when you when you are RSD analyses uh, are fitting a template to the full shape of the measured galaxy power spectrum okay. so in the literature full shape and, and RSD are sometimes used interchangeably. Okay. <laughs> Nice clarification. Thanks. Um, so maybe you're going to this immediately, but um, last time I was not very good at the timing. I mean, it's, it's mostly my fault for asking lots of questions as, as we're going. Um, so what would be really cool is, is linking this now to to like the H naught and the Omega matters that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so I will do that. Uh, it, as these are slides that I prepared for uh, a previous talk, uh, I've probably got a few redundant ones in the middle. Yeah, and you probably those. didn't have some annoying person constantly asking questions in the, <laughs> at the talk. Uh, oh, but I, I do actually want to just sort of highlight this because okay. um, uh, so so uh, another interesting way of analyzing galaxy survey data that people have been looking at for for a long time mm -hmm. is uh, measuring the bi spectrum. Right. So uh, uh -huh. you know you go to higher order statistics than uh, than just the galaxy power spectrum by going mm -hmm. to bi spectrum and you get more information out of it. Uh, and it's obviously very promising because you uh, you get a lot more information. Mm -hmm. But so this this just shows you a comparison. It, this is exactly the same uh, data from the BOSS survey, uh, and on the left is um, uh, the information gain that you get uh, going from power spectrum to bi spectrum, and then on the right is going from power spectrum to power spectrum plus voids. Mm -hmm. Right uh, and. Uh, the 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 amount of information that you g gain from adding voids is far exceeds what you get from the bispectrum. Yeah, so I, I'm going to have to apologize in advance for going on a bit of a tangent here, but um, so initially everything's linear, right? So the power spectrum has all the information. So the reason why voids are gaining information and bispectrum are gaining information is that something has happened that's nonlinear. Now, now your void stuff is still quite linear as, as you said I guess and so you're sort of gaining information there because you're actually sort of more isolating the part where, where the non-linearity isn't messing things up so is it perhaps fair to say that the reason the bi spectrum is not doing as well is that it's actually <coughs> almost doing it in the wrong way that it's kind of like isolating sort of non-linear aspect which is very hard to model whereas what you're doing is actually isolating the stuff that looks more like it did at the beginning of the universe where things are more predictable uh, yeah, I, I suppose you could put it like that. Uh, and so another way of, of maybe saying the same thing is that uh, modeling both the power spectrum and the bi spectrum in the way that, that is normally done it is hard because of these nonlinearities. So you, in fact, you have to put a cutoff 
scale yeah. uh, beyond which you don't trust your model anymore. Uh, and so in the figure on the left uh, actually even says what the cutoff scale is for, right. for these analyses. Uh, and so you've got a K-max of, of 0.22 H megaparsec inverse, right? So you're not able to use all the, the, the information in the data because you can't extend your model uh, down to all, to include all scales. And whereas on, uh, on your, oh, sorry, yeah, on your voids, you are like getting to smaller scales, I guess. In, in a way, you're getting to smaller scales by sort of focusing on the regions where uh, the evolution is more linear and, and so therefore you're better able to model things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Carry on. Carry on. Sorry for the interruption. Okay. Uh, right. So, uh, cosmological implications. Let's uh, maybe start with uh, with this one, right? Because you mentioned H naught first. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, th there's the the big discrepancy in, in cosmology. Everybody excited at the moment is uh, the values of H naught that you get out from from the CMB mm -hmm. from Planck. Uh, which favors a value of about 67.3 or something mm -hmm. uh, with very small error bars. So 67.3 plus or minus 0.5. Uh, and then the value that you get from doing local distance ladder measurements, uh, which uh, has larger error bars, but is about 74 plus or minus 1.4. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then there are a few other uh, types of, of ways of doing this measurement that are um, not quite uh, at the same level of, of uh, precision, but if you look at uh, strong, delay, um, strong lensing time delays uh, uh, as a way of, of measuring H0, then you get a value which is uh, compatible with the local distance ladder, quite a high value, 73 or so, right. uh, and the error bars are, are a little bit larger. Right. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can use uh, barren acoustic oscillations for BAO information um, and, and the BAO doesn't tell you H0 by itself. Uh, like I said right when you're talking about the, the void galaxy correlation, H0 is a constant that gets multiplied out. The BAO tells you uh, the uh, ratio of, or, well it, it tells you essentially something that is H0 times what the sound horizon scale was at, uh, at at the drag epoch, mm. uh, so roughly speaking, the sound horizon at, at recombination. Uh, so if some way you can get a constraint on, on that sound horizon, then H naught times RD, uh, you've, you've got a constraint on RD and you can then read off the value of H naught. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you could calibrate the sound horizon off the CMB uh, which is, is the way that BAO are traditionally used. Uh, but if you want to be completely independent of the CMB anisotropies, at least, then you can use um, uh, a Big Bang nuclear synthesis predictions and, and measurements of the, like the deuterium abundance and so on uh, to, to set a weaker constraint on uh, omega baryon times little eight squared. Mm. Uh, and when you put that in, then that kind of gives you some uh, somewhat conservative weak constraint on the sound horizon and therefore you get a measurement of H0. Yeah. Right? Now, uh, if you add voids information to the BAO, then you are dramatically tightening uh, your measured error bars on uh, the distance scale to the redshift at which your galaxy survey is and the expansion rate at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, those two things combined with the same prior on, on uh, from uh, nuclear synthesis uh, then gives you a tighter constraint on uh, H0. Yeah, so the green one to the orange one on the figure. Yeah, so exactly. So if you just take uh, standard BAO plus uh, BBN for Big Bang nuclear synthesis, you get this green contour, uh, which is consistent with pretty much everything. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's consistent with Planck and it's also consistent with the local distance ladder. Mm. Uh, if you then add the void information, you dramatically shrink that down to the, the orange contour. Now the orange result is, is kind of tantalizingly uh, not so consistent with Planck anymore. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that result is H0 of 72.3 plus or minus 1.9. Yeah. 
What if you added, or maybe you haven't done this, but if instead of using the BBN, you use the, the Planck sound horizon numbers? Right. So if you, if you take the sound horizon from Planck, then you will get uh, an H naught that is consistent with Planck. Ah. Uh, in, in this, and, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, the, the sound horizon measurement from Planck is uh, very much more precise than the, the BBN constraint you have. So it will pull you down towards the Planck value of H0. We didn't actually... Okay. Yeah, I've confused myself about something. I have to go away and think about that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <coughs> Clarifying my confusion won't be worth the time. Um, yeah, cool. Carry on. Okay, so, so uh, you, you can measure BAO from many different uh, galaxy surveys and, and this orange contour here includes all the BAO from uh, all galaxy and, and quasar so samples that are at redshift of less than two, plus the voids, and the voids we've only so far measured at one redshift, and that is a redshift of 0.57. Right? Yeah. Uh, and that then gives you this value that is more compatible with the reset all local distance ladder result, yeah. uh, and is about 2.6 sigma or so away from Planck. Yeah. But on the other hand, if you now use the Lyman alpha BAO uh, results, mm -hmm. and these are redshift of about 2.3, or a little bit higher than 2.3, uh, then partly because of the way that Lyman alpha uh, BAO is measured, which is measured much more along these skewers uh, aligned along the line of sight, and partly because it's at a much higher redshift, uh, you have a different degeneracy direction for that measurement. Uh, and it so happens that that only overlaps with the green and orange contours right over towards the mm. to one one side of them, and therefore, if you add the the high redshift Lyman alpha BAO results in as well, mm. and you pull towards this this blue contour, yeah. yeah. So you're pulling the results back down towards smaller H naught, uh, and now you're compatible with Planck again, and less compatible with yeah. The, yeah. It makes me want to ask if you if you can do a, a like a similar underdense <coughs> Lyman alpha void e type of uh, extra thing. I don't know enough about Lyman alpha to know how possible that would be. Uh, well, I, some people have been uh, starting to look at at voids in the Lyman alpha. Okay. Uh, and I have seen a, a few papers on that, but it's it's very early days, and I don't think uh, sure. Uh, I don't think there's reliable results from doing a measurement like this yet. Uh, but you know uh, it's, it's pretty early days for for all of void science yeah. uh, and, and there's a lot of exciting development that's happening um, so uh, stay tuned I guess in a few years maybe that there, there'll be something somewhere yeah. using that moment out cool. so I, I think this is like a really <laughs> coherent story that has been told are, are there a few more things that you, you find really pertinent to to tell because we, we might actually be able to finish within an hour if we if we wrap up soon and I would be very like um like uh, yeah surprised cool. so, and impressed uh, if we the, did it. There was just just like uh, one other thing that I, I found really interesting okay, uh, cool. with doing this is that uh, given that that we get uh, these constraints so much better on on uh, the distance scale and um, the expansion rate yeah. at, uh, at redshifts. Uh, of 0.57, but also BAO gives you measurements of the expansion rate at, at various other redshifts. Um, that's constraining the expansion history of the universe as a function of time. And that mm -hmm. means that we get constraints on uh, on dark energy and how, mm. how dark energy has been affecting that expansion rate, right? Mm. Um, and you don't, you just need BAO for this. You don't need uh, to combine it with any other information. Uh, so you, you can have a model where uh, you just allow the value of dark energy to be a free parameter uh, and uh, you allow some curvature. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's, it's possible um, that, I mean, it's not really possible, but it's, it's a thing that people have been considering uh, for, for many years, which is that maybe the, there's... Uh, uh, no actual acceleration and, and that instead it could be explained with a, a curvature within this model. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was, this was one of the, the main uh, goals of supernova cosmology 
was to try to distinguish between an open universe and one that has an acceleration, right? Um, and for uh, a long time, uh, supernova have been regarded as the best evidence at low redshifts or direct evidence of the acceleration of the universe because they constrain dark energy like this. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, uh, you can do this with BAO as well. And you can do it even better with BAO and voids. Uh, and so if you combine, uh, so supernovae in this, this figure are the, the blue contour uh, the blue contours, uh, BAO are the green ones, and that those are fairly comparable, although they have slightly different directions, degeneracy different directions. But if you take BAO plus voids, you get the orange contours, and, and those are uh, first of all, it's overwhelming evidence for late time acceleration. Right, because the the open universe would be down at zero zero point three. Yeah, exactly. So um, so you you have to have uh, an, a, a lambda component mm -hmm. uh, at, at over ten sigma significance. Uh, and also the, the orange contours are so much smaller than the blue ones. And the, in fact, the, uh, now, uh, BAO and voids are giving you the best late time mm. direct evidence for, for dark energy, uh, mm. better than the supernova. Uh, of course you also have evidence for Lambda coming from CMB. Uh, and, uh, one of the other questions of, of interest, uh, currently is how compatible uh, uh, are the CMB constraints with constraints from supernovae and from BAO and so on. Uh, and uh, the, the CMB uh, pink contours here only just about touch uh, the orange and green ones, uh, right. which is, is something that people have been pointing out as, uh, as a bit of a problem for the concordance model. So just to compare this plot now, 2020, uh, with the previous version of it, uh, from 2010 hmm. uh, and the 2010 version is a very famous plot that everyone will have seen and it's always in everybody's talks and textbooks and so on hmm. Hmm. things have changed in 10 years uh, right, yeah. and and uh, they've changed in a way that now BAO is, is better than supernova also the, the CMB doesn't doesn't quite provide the same concordance anymore yeah everything's shrunk but not onto that concordance tiny ellipsoid ellipse but to a uh, yeah clashing ones that's interesting hmm. cool um any any more slides or can we do a, like a last sort of few uh, minutes we, we have more slides but uh, you know uh, these are, are the, the exciting things uh, you can also do stuff with um uh with measuring the dark energy equation of state maybe the dark energy is in a cosmological constant uh, if you allow it to vary with time, how well and that would, that's in the paper, so people can can see that. So. Yeah, exactly. And the the basic answer is you can constrain it better when you use this data, quite a lot better. Yeah. But uh, the answer is still the favoured answer is still consistent with the cosmological constant. Right. Cool. So, do you want to um, just repeat those two things you wanted people to to take away, or I can uh, repeat them because I think I remember them. Um, well, so the first thing I'd like people to take away is that this is a really powerful method for analyzing data from galaxy surveys. Uh, and we, you put this in and it's essentially for free because you, you're getting the data anyway. You don't need to do anything new or any new observations over what you're doing anyway for BAO. Uh, but you do this new analysis and you get a whole lot more information. Um, and, and it really tightens all your cosmological constraints. Uh, and then uh, we've provided some sort of tantalizing answers towards uh, the, the H naught discrepancy. You know, we've, we've shed a little bit of new light on it. It's not solved by, by any means. Uh, and uh, it's also interesting that, that now actually the, the strongest late time evidence for, for dark energy comes from BAO plus voids and, and not from traditional supernova. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's interesting. And they, the, those two data sets are, are consistent, even if the CMB is starting to become... Yeah, yeah, they, they are consistent and they, they have no systematic effects in common. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so people, people often worry about various systematics that might affect supernovae, uh, but none of those affect the BAO and yet the result that you get is completely consistent. Or if there is some systematic that's in common, it's, it's like very <coughs> subtle, weird, dust or... I mean, it would be a very 
complicated systematic that somehow is affecting these two very, very different measurements. Um, I can't think of anything. Right, right. Of so, so whoever thinks of that systematic, it, it might not be new fundamental yeah. physics, but it's going to be crazy interesting new astrophysics that no one has ever considered. It, it would certainly be interesting if somebody could, could find a link between them. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, I I'm, want to ask like the last question I had, which was, um, if you weren't working on this, like what is the most interesting thing that you're not working on in cosmology? <laughs> Um, and uh, so I'll, I'll ask it anyway, but yeah, just maybe answer briefly. Hmm. Uh, so I think the most interesting thing in cosmology at the moment is is uh, is the H naught question. Oh, I mean, but you're not working on. <laughs> I, I'm I'm sort of tangentially working on, but uh, you know, really, uh, the question is. Uh, what is it that is different about the local distance ladder measurements and the CMB measurements? So the people who are really working on this are the ones who are the, the experts trying to nail down what's, what's happening with the local distance ladder or, um, uh, or the CMB and potentially their systematics. It, it isn't, it, it's never going to be a simple systematic. If it is some, some sort of a systematic, it's, it's a complicated and very interesting new thing that we're going to learn about. Uh, it's potentially some new physical effect, but, and I'm not really working on theories of new physical effects that could explain it either. Uh, but I'm very interested in, in what people are coming up with. I think, I think really that's, that's a thing. I'll, I'll accept that as a thing, you, thing you're not yeah. working on. Cool. Um, thanks very much for, um, for uh, participating in this. Um, it's, it was, uh, it's been very good fun. Awesome. Thank you.